So where are you at? Are you in Japan? Uh, I'm actually in uh, South Korea. Uh, oh, in I've South Korea. For, yeah, I've lived here for the last... Oh, shoot. It's going close to four years, but I was uh, before four years, I was on and off visiting quite often. Um, so I've been in Korea for a long time now. Do you have a YouTube or other channel that you would like to share? Um, yeah, I just, uh, I sometimes stream on D live, um, talking about flat earth stuff and Eastern Orthodoxy and sometimes gaming and learning Korean and whatnot. So it's just D live Eastern ortho bear. Eastern I, uh, ortho a, bear. Are you a, are yeah. you a bear, an Owen Benjamin follower? Um, I've been a Owen Benjamin follower for a long time. And the only reason I joined D live was because he was on there. I'm like, you know what? Because he's the one that got me on here. I'll do the honor of putting bear in my name so <laughs> <laughs> awesome so, I'm, i made yeah. a i made a youtube account that uh, is called globuster bear because you know <laughs> in honor of owen i met him at the conference in dallas and what god what a great guy he is he's really he is, intelligent. He's very nice could you please describe your background and education um so my background was uh got out of got out of high school and then i went to college for about three years um almost had a degree in history particular in medieval studies and then um i decided to travel abroad a little bit before i uh finished my uh degree mm -hmm. and uh ended up meeting my wife um not not too long after that um i we got married and uh, she got pregnant and at the time i was like well it's either you know uh bite the bullet and take out tons of student loans to provide for her and a child and go to school, or I can just join the military, which is something I was always thinking about since I was in high school. So I joined the air force. Um, and I was put into, um, specifically the client systems technician, um, route, which is mostly computers, uh, servers, uh, setting up networks, things of that nature, big scale projects, um, in the comms field. Um, but I also have a, a, um, a fair amount of experience uh, with uh, ground, ground to ground radio, ground to air radio, working with the radio teams. So I have a, we had to learn all of that. So I have a wide variety of background and all, um, a lot of experience with a lot of different career fields because everyone breaks computers. So yeah, yeah, exactly. That's kind of my, yeah. what I've gone into lately is uh, computer and IT network engineering. But uh, yeah. my background's always been in communications engineering and RF. But uh, the last 20 years or so, it's been nothing but computers. So where'd you go to tech school at? Uh, Kiesler. You, huh, that's where I went to tech school. Uh, yeah, yeah. They haven't changed. Uh, RF and uh, all those people still go out through there. So um, all the basically the entire comm field goes through Kiesler now. They changed it up recently. And pretty much everyone who um, works in a comm squadron will go through Kiesler. So. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Wow. Small world. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you sound like you're not surprised. You must've, you, I take it you followed Globusters for a while. Yeah. I, I heard recently that you were in the comms field in the air force at some point, And it was just kind of, I didn't remember who specifically it was, but I kind of guessed it was you because of the voice um, similarities that I've heard. So mm -hmm. you yeah. have a, a deeper, more distinct voice. I have a, high-pitched little girly sounding voice so <laughs> i always admit that like in person it doesn't sound nearly as bad as it does over the mic but it just the mic makes me sound like i'm 12 yeah so. yeah just get one of those really bass enhanced microphones you'd be good to go <laughs> yeah i might have to do that at some point awesome all right so and your current occupation then is still it i take it yeah, I was in IT up till recently. Um, uh, unfortunately, the Air Force messed up my out processing, so I the company couldn't keep me hired on because uh, my clearance is still being held with the Air Force, and they didn't release it on time. So I'm currently in the market looking for a new job, but um, that's basically my career field is IT and communications. Okay, cool. M mostly for the DoD. Right, right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Gotcha. So how did you first uh, come upon Flat Earth, and uh, what do you think about it? Well, I've always heard about Flat Earth um, from being in a history major. I you know, heard about it here and there, but for the most part, they don't talk too much about what the early people thought of cosmology, to be honest, um, and um, what they thought about uh, the Earth as a whole. Uh, history for some reason tends to wipe all that so I, I had a little bit of experience with that but I didn't really start seriously getting into it until 
um, um, early 2019. And that's when I started looking into some of the stuff. Actually, the, for my first experience was with Taboo Conspiracy. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And kind of left it at there. And then it was when Owen Benjamin found Taboo Conspiracy that I actually was like, oh, wow, that's um, a lot of compelling points. And that's when I started really digging into it and look, uh, second guessing some of the stuff that I was uh, previously just taking for granted. So, Yeah, that's wow. That's been very, very recent then, because I remember when Owen did that video where he was highlighting uh, Ben's work, uh, we were actually in North Carolina for the Flattoberfest. So that was around the 20th of October. So you've been you're brand new. Yeah, I'm pretty new. Yeah. Um, but once I, but I'm, I've always been of the opinion that if something makes sense and it, and, and, um, it's, and if I can't come up with a valid reason to, um, reject it, I'm going to probably just dig deep into it. And, um, if I don't find anything that's super controversial, I'll probably just say, yeah, this is probably accurate. So, I don't, I don't tend to play games like that. I, I don't like it. I think people um, tend to rigid, um, not like to rock the boat, but I don't really care about that. Like my parents threw a fit when I told them that I was thinking the earth is flat. <laughs> <I'll bet. laughs> I was like, mom, I'm pretty sure the earth is flat. Like uh, I'm looking into all this stuff and I just can't see any, any support for a globe earth model. And they're just like, what are you talking about? Just flipped. My mom flipped. My dad didn't really care. He's like, eh, whatever. Believe what you want to believe. I don't care. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I, I very much understand, you know, your quick conversion because honestly, I had been looking at, at NASA and, you know, their fakery and stuff for a long time, but yeah. I was thinking, you know, it was for totally different reasons. And, you know, all it really took was one uh, blog post on uh, uh, clues forums and I read that and the guy made a beautiful post and he made all these points and, you know, it just all hit me All my pilots training, all my microwave background, all that stuff hit me. And it's like, yeah. oh my God, there it is. There's the answer. So, uh, yep. And I was same for me. I always questioned them. I never believed the moon landing ever since I was in like eighth grade. Um, actually I had, it's funny. I had a science teacher. Um, and it was, I, I loved this science teacher. He, he taught uh, astronomy and, um, when I was younger, he taught, he, he played two videos. One was like kind of a, a um, video that a documentary debunking the moon, the moon landing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he would play the counterpoint to it. And the counterpoint was so laughably bad that I was like, there's no way we went to the moon. It's a bunch of BS. And so I never bought the moon landing stuff, but I never really second guess like globe earth model because it you never really had to it was always just a given go you know growing up. i'm semi younger than most people i'm 26 mm -hmm. um so you know growing up i was you know i was a early, late 90s baby early 2000s and all of this was a given there was no guessing second guessing any of that stuff um so tell me a little bit about you know what makes you think you know at least professionally from your job and everything uh, and people you've dealt with in your job that uh, you know lead you to believe also that the earth is flat so in my career field i i i have the the blessing and the curse of interacting with a, a wide variety of career fields in the air force so i i worked with everything from pilots to generals to intel to uh ground to air radio um, I worked a lot with their RF transmissions guys because um, our career fields were very closely linked. I, I worked on a lot of big projects with them. So I had to have a general understanding of a ton of comm fields, including RF transmissions. And um, it was it was it was once I started believing in the flat earth stuff and once I started being convinced of that, I started, you know, going back in in my head and going through some of. The things that I was questioning, right? So, so some of the things that I did in my career field and um, ground to air radio was what really lit a green light in my head. I was like, whoa, that doesn't make any sense based on what they teach us in tech school and based on what they teach us in the, uh, um, in the manuals on how our ground radar technology and uh, ground to air radar technologies uh, works with, uh, when we're sending radio signals to planes and stuff like that. None mm -hmm. of that makes sense with the globe model based on the ionosphere. And 
I was like, the ionosphere completely contradicts what we do um, in our career field. I said, it makes it nearly impossible um, if what they're saying is true. Now they could probably come up with some convoluted excuse, but it just doesn't make sense. So I remember it was, I think it was a, uh, I put all the puzzle pieces together for the ground to air radio stuff. Uh, when you guys had a, uh, a podcast about the very first radio long distance radio transmission. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't remember who did that. Um, it's, I'm still blanking on the name, but, um, I remember everyone thought all the, all the major scientists of the day said, there's no way you can be, uh, send a radio wave that far because of the curve of the earth. It's going to stop, you know, it's going to block it. Yeah, it was Marconi because, by the way. Mm -hmm. And, ev and, and I was like, well, that, that makes sense. Cause the, the, the idea of the ionosphere wasn't even theorized at the time. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if they didn't theorize it, when you're sending a signal, a radio wave signal into the air, there should be a mathematical curve that you can measure. Um, so if you're sending a frequent, uh, a radio wave frequency at a certain um, level into the ionosphere, we should be able to, at, at, on some level, be able to measure the mathematical curve of how much the ionosphere curves the, the radio waves. Right. But he didn't take any of those calculations into consideration. So if that's the case, it was either a miracle he managed to send it to the right spot, because if he didn't do any of those calculations, how did he hit the right spot? How did he even know it was going to go to the right area? So either – and so I'm like for, for, for that's one pro major problem with the ionosphere is they theorized it, but the person who got the radio signal to go there to begin with didn't even take the mathematical equations into account. So how does that make any sense at all as to um, how it works? Exactly. Because – um, and, and then, and then if you think about, um, the ionosphere is theorized to be a, a part of the atmosphere, right? It's a layer of the atmosphere, but it's not a thick band. So when you're taught about it in school, they don't really go into much detail as to what it is. Cause they don't actually have much evidence for what it is. They just kind of generally give you this kind of hand waving explanation that it's a part of the atmosphere. But if you know anything about air and the atmosphere in general you know it's not like a thick band like all these different layers of the atmosphere aren't a band they're graduations so they slowly become thicker and thicker until they meet a certain threshold of being mostly of one thing that's why they call it a different layer right and so there should be a gradual um the uh, the ionosphere should be gradually getting thicker and thicker but but by that argument and by, by that train of thought, that means that it should gradually warp the radio wave signals that we send up there more and more and more until it reaches a certain point. But we don't see any – when we're sending um, radio um, transmission signals, we don't see any effect on it really at all. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just magically somehow curves, and we don't see a, gradu a graduation. It just – hits this band and it just curves down and it's like that doesn't make any sense with how the atmosphere works on any other um thing that we know of that we can actually test mm -hmm. you know we know that the atmosphere gets a little thinner the higher you go mm -hmm. but they're suggesting the opposite that the ionosphere gets thicker as you go closer but there's no evidence that it there's any ionosphere up to that point they're, the only evidence they have is that it allegedly curves so for me, I started questioning all that. I'm like, okay, so let's let's think about this. Some of our most advanced, and I'm, I think, did you say you're a pilot? Yes, I am. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know a little bit about the some of the fighter planes. I don't know if uh, you are familiar with some of the newer ones, but for example, like the U two. Oh yeah, I'm very familiar with that, the U two. That ri that ridiculously loud one that like fills the whole base with sound. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, that plane left it off from my base regularly for basically at least on a daily basis, sometimes less, um, um, in a, in a given week. And we know that those planes go so high up in the air at some points that they skirt along the very edge of what we can even consider the atmosphere. 
And yet we can send, when we send signals to those planes, I have friends that work on that stuff. When they send radio signals to any of those planes that are so high up in the air, they just do a straight shot. They said, we just point and aim. We don't take any, the, the equipment doesn't take any sort of mathematical curve into consideration. And even though they can argue that high frequency um, can go further into the atmosphere, it still has a curve eventually. And there's still a warping effect that they argue happens. But they don't take any of that into consideration when they do it. Right. So for me, that just tells me that either the ionosphere is a bunch of BS and either there's something else that is causing the radio waves to curve around a, a, the, the, a, allegedly the globe or the earth is flat. And, and then for me, what is, what, is the, what is the simplest answer? The simplest answer is that it's actually flat. Yeah. Um, it doesn't, so that, so for me, the ionosphere has no evidence for it. And there's a ton of evidence that contradicts it. A lot of the technology we use doesn't take it into a, it doesn't factor it in at all. And uh, so that's kind of what I, uh, um, yeah, that's kind of the big thing for me. Um, and also I've talked to a lot of pilots and a lot of them when they're, you know, comfortable with you and they're, you know, they're at the bars off base and stuff like that. They'll tell you, they're like, yeah, man, I don't, I don't, I, I never seen any curve, you know, <laughs> and they'll say <laughs> stuff like that. And, um, some of them obviously don't even think about it. They're just like, eh, yeah, I don't really think about it. But uh, cause a lot, I, I, honestly, no offense to you, but a lot of the pilots are jocks. They, they, exactly. They, they know, they know how to fly the planes, but they're not technical know-how guys, you know? Exactly. So, uh, I'm more of a technician. Mm -hmm. So I, I look into all this stuff. I'm like, Oh, well, that's interesting. Well, why does it do this? You know, but they're more of like, I just like flying, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. you know, in all honesty, I wasn't, I wasn't an air force pilot. However, I got my pilot's license at the Keesler air force base aero club. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, and I paid for all of it. I, I lived there, you know, I would take people on flights, you know, to, to oversee Biloxi and, you know, the Gulf coast in general, um, because mm -hmm. it was really a scenic area, especially from the air. Um, mm -hmm. so, but I was, in, I was a 303, which was a ATC radar, uh, not an operator, but a technician. I, I did a lot of TDY, you know, um, installing them and repairing them yeah. and stuff like that. So yep. I was very definitely on the technical side of it also, but, but you're right. Um, there, there isn't, I've never seen any curve. And of course I've, I've never flown any jet aircraft, but, um, you know, when you think about everything you are ever taught about as a pilot, they never teach you anything about curvature or global navigation or, you know, no. anything spherical. It's just, it's just not there. And people like Wolfie 20 that, uh, Wolfie 60 20 that say that that is true. They're full of it. Um, no, it, you know. <laughs> they don't. And I, and I could tell, I could tell them for a fact that we, none of the career fields that I've ever talked to have ever and I don't like just say, hey, do you believe in the flat earth? I just be like subtly like, so like, how, how do you, like when I'm asking about the equipment, I'll be just like, so how do you factor in the, the, the spin of the earth and the curve of the earth? They'll just look at me weird and be like, um, we don't. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> exactly. like, why, why would we do that? And they, they don't even second guess it because they're just like, ah, we, we don't need to. It's like, ah, there's, there's some reason, but we're not going to look too deep into it because they're not the most technicians aren't the guys that develop any of this stuff. They just maintain it. Right. Um. Um, they don't actually like in like create it. They don't understand every intricacy of it. So a lot of them won't look deeper into it. Um, and, and another thing is, and my brother's in the Air Force as well. He's still in. Um, uh, he work he works out of Seattle. Without fail, from Seattle, we would fly. And I've talked to pilots about this. They said they don't understand at all why we do this, but they say we go from Seattle along the edge of Canada through uh, along the edge of Alaska, down through Russia, down through China. They said that makes no sense. It's almost doubling the amount of time and fuel that we have to use to get to these places on, on the globe earth model. Right. Cause they're, they're talking to me as if the globe earth is a given. So uh, that, that's kind of my general um, stuff that really made me go like, nah, none of this adds up. We're probably on a flat earth. Um, now, is it a flat earth or is it something else? I don't know. No, like, I, I don't know. But I do know that it, it, there is no significant curvature and there's no, nothing to suggest that we're a spinning globe. Right. So. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly believe that it's flat. I, you know, we've done enough tests and, you know, uh, uh, all my research lead me to believe that, you know, it's absolutely flat, but um, you know, how long it goes or how far it stretches, I have no idea. But um, so getting yeah. back to 
the RF communication stuff. I just wanted to make a couple sure. comments about that. But yeah, I'm very familiar with the U2 plane, and it's uh, it's probably up there getting close to the D layer of the ionosphere, the so-called ionosphere, um, which yeah. starts at around 60 kilometers um, and goes up to about 80 kilometers, something like that. Um, and I don't I don't think that the U2 could possibly fly that high, but maybe you know. Um, it starts along the edge, if I remember. Yeah. And, and then, of course, after the D layer comes the E layer. And the E layer is where I have found a lot of interesting anomalies. I mean, the E layer, which starts at basically about 62 miles or 100 kilometers, all kinds mm -hmm. of things seem to stop there. And to me, that's the hard barrier firmament, if you will, um, uh, that I think is, is actually there. And I think there's a lot of evidence for it. But uh, I think in between the D layer and the E layer, if you are down in the lower bands, like the HF bands, um, that you can have what would be kind of a ducting effect in between those. Because, you know, as I'm also a ham radio operator. And one of the mm -hmm. things they taught us in ham radio is, you know, the way that propagation works in the HF bands, which would be like 3 to 30 megahertz or yeah, you know, yeah, 1 yeah. to 30, et cetera, is that, you know, you you fire off your Yagi, it bounces off the ionosphere, comes down, bounces off the earth, then it bounce, goes back up and bounces off the ionosphere and it'll actually go around the world doing that. And of course now, you know, the more I've learned about it and the more I think about it, it's like RF signals do not bounce off of the ground in general. They can bounce off of things on the ground, hard things like metal, things like that. But it is the natural, it's the natural way of things for uh, electromagnetic energies Etc. to return to Earth ground and not leave it again. So, you know, I started thinking about that and that, you know, became instantly, you know, BS for me because I was trying to figure out, well, then how are we getting these long distance yeah. communications? And uh, yeah, I mean, obviously there's line of sight, which is, which explains most of it. Um, but I believe that uh, uh, atmospheric ducting is also a very big part of it. Um, that can, you know, actually facilitate like what's called QRP or low power communications. Yeah. If a buddy, a pilot buddy of mine can receive, uh, um, RF signals basically mm -hmm. from way further than, um, should be possible, um, on the globe earth model as well. Mm -hmm. So that's another problem. Um, but that's not as much to do with the ionosphere but allegedly if the globe earth model is there it should hit the ionosphere before it ever gets to the plane but it still gets to the plane without any curve and right. like i said no one factors in any sort of distortion effect from the ionosphere in their equipment or in their mathematics and i i i think the the big nail in the coffin is that original test that guy, even if they say, oh, yeah, the, the, the instruments are automatically tuned for the curve nowadays, right? Let's just say they use that excuse. Mm -hmm. Back then, he didn't even know. None of them even theorized it existed. Right. And none of them had done any tests to see how much it curves by and what the rate of the curve is on different frequencies. None of them did any of those tests. So it doesn't make any sense that he – it would be miraculous for him to get it right the first time. Miraculous. Right. Well, and also – Tested a thousand times, it'd be miraculous. Sure, and think about Loran systems, right? Um, which is essentially the GPS on the ground. I think it's GPS. Period. You know, a Loran, but you know they're supposedly synchronizing these signals, you know, down to the microsecond, uh, if not even quicker than that, to be able to give range and and uh, ranging in motion, right? Speed detection, mm -hmm. etc. And it's like, how could that possibly work when the Loran stations are? you know, 60, 100, 200 miles apart, um, yeah. you know, they, you can't, you cannot say, well, it's going up and ducting or it's skipping or anything like that, because that obviously would take a lot of time. So, I mean, there's a lot of problems in RF propagation that disprove, yeah. you know, the curvature of the earth. Based on what they teach us in tech school and based on what they teach us in the, uh, um, in the manuals on how our ground radar technology and uh, ground to air radar technologies uh, works with uh, when we're sending radio signals to planes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. None of that makes sense with the globe model based on the ionosphere. 